We are delighted to be here with the HBS Club of Toronto, HBS Healthcare Alumni Association and Harvard Alumni in Healthcare leading the session with the support of the Canadian Club of Toronto, HBS Clubs of Italy, Dallas, London and the HBS Association of Boston. Our speakers will provide insights from biotech, patient advocacy, physician, provider and pharmacy perspectives. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce our first panelist, Brian Heath the Vice President and General Manager of Amgen Canada. Uh, Brian Heath, with 20 years of experience in pharmaceutical and biotech industry, has consistently put patients first. Since joining Amgen Canada, Brian has been named to the Board of Directors of Innovative Medicines Canada, IMC, and the Advanced Coronary Treatment Foundation, ACT. Brian's work has been highlighted in Pharmaceutical Executive, with three Doctor's Choice Awards and by PM360 Trailblazer Award. Prior to his current role, Brian was the therapeutic area leader for oncology, hematology, and biosimilars across 35 countries at Amgen. Prior to Amgen, Brian held sales and marketing positions at a number of pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical companies. Brian holds a Bachelor of Sciences degree from Brigham Young University and an MBA from Harvard Business School. We're delighted to have Brian with us. Brian, uh, over to you to introduce the topic of our session today. Thank you very much, uh, Boris, for the introduction. Um, look, I, I want to acknowledge the tremendous efforts of frontline healthcare workers who continue to deal with many impacts of COVID-19. It's had a tremendous impact on patients, it's impacted caregivers, and the healthcare community at large. And I think it's important to acknowledge that. And I think we also need to remember those who have lost loved ones from COVID-19 uh, or as a result uh, of the pandemic. It's been an unprecedented event, uh, which has had enormous repercussions, not only to patients and uh, healthcare workers, but also for the business community uh, and the economy. And I'm excited that uh, we have on the webinar here uh, leaders uh, from across industries and across sectors to have uh, this discussion. Now, <clears throat> there's growing conversation and a collective ambition towards building more resiliency into Canada's healthcare system. So I want to talk about that for a moment. Resilience is a measure of a system's ability to respond to a significant disruption or shock. Now, most private and public institutions are much more familiar with measuring efficiency and cost, but how do you measure resilience? As a shock occurs, you need to measure how the system manages the shock, how the system learns from the shock, and of course, its level of preparation for the next disruption. So you will recall, for example, that the highly visible uh, measures of our healthcare system throughout COVID-19, it was not efficiency, it wasn't sustainability, and it was not cost. Rather, the measures we tracked, I mean, they're the measures that commanded the public's attention and our interest on a daily basis. Those measures were patient outcomes. It was the incidence and prevalence of COVID, was hospitalizations from COVID, was mortality from COVID. It was uh, for a long period of time, the timing of access to vaccines and therapeutics. When, when are we gonna get the vaccine, right? And the disruptions in care across the spectrum of chronic and acute diseases. So the measures changed. So I'm, I'm grateful for the panel discussion today and the opportunity to engage with different stakeholders from across the healthcare system and to share um, our experiences, their experiences in managing and learning from the shock of COVID-19. As we begin to slowly emerge from the worst of the pandemic, we are faced with the reality that it exposed some fragility within our healthcare system. Gaps in care, I would say especially preventative care, it reduced our resilience to the shock of COVID-19. So this fragility was especially noticeable in the disproportionate impact that COVID had on the elderly in our long-term care homes. Care gaps were also evident and they are also currently evident in oncology, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, 
mental health and bone health, just to name a few. So the accomplishment and the importance of vaccines and therapies, it's been a remarkable and a remarkable global success. But now as we continue to pursue broader vaccination, we also need to address the indirect and the secondary impacts of the pandemic. And a measure of our resilience will be how we address the longer wait times for many elective surgeries, how we address the serious diagnostic screening and treatment disruptions for patients. So for example, we know here in Canada, based off of a survey, that over half of cancer patients have reported that their appointments have been canceled or postponed or rescheduled. And some of them are waiting almost a month for a new date. We know the Ontario Medical Association estimates a backlog of nearly 16 million healthcare services. And resilient healthcare systems are those that are best positioned to predict and prevent disease by proactively intervening early and delivering solutions that provide the highest value to patients in society. And we really need to allocate more resources to prevention uh, because a healthier population will be much better prepared and less vulnerable to future shocks. So everyone has a responsibility uh, to uh, allocate um, more resources to prevention and everyone has a stake and some responsibility in their own health and in the health of the population. Working together, I believe leaders across healthcare uh, and also leaders in other public and private sectors need to take action. We need to build health systems that are faster, they're more agile, more proactive. We need to accelerate the time to access innovative diagnostics, vaccines, and treatments. We should be collaborating to advance systematic measurement and data sharing to support evidence-based decision-making. We need to increase our focus on predicting and preventing disease. And not only should we measure cost, but we need to measure the value of good health. And finally, we need to promote public-private partnerships, the kind that we saw during COVID that were so effective to help solve some of the pressing and current gaps in care so we're better prepared for future shocks. Now, just to close here, homeostasis is a central and organizing principle of physiology. It's a self-regulating process by which organisms, they maintain stability in response to changing external conditions. In our case, we don't want our system of many, many interconnected stakeholders to self-regulate their way back to our previous state of unpreparedness. Instead, we need bold action and partnership. Homeostasis occurs by the interrelated actions of its individual parts. And it's best understood by looking at the entirety of the system as opposed to just its individual parts. So as leaders, each of us needs to ask how the pandemic impacted the health of our staff, our customers, our patients and other stakeholders. We need to capture our learnings and we need to think about how and with whom we will collaborate to build more resilience for our health in the future. So I look forward to the perspectives of all of these highly respected panelists on the successes they observed, the accomplishments they achieved, and also the opportunities that they see uh, emerging from COVID-19 uh, in Canada. Ryan, thank you for this important context for our discussion. I would now like to introduce our second panelist, Barry Stein, president of Colorectal Cancer Canada. Barry graduated from McGill University and has been a member of Bureau de Quebec since 1981. He's an accomplished lawyer and as the president of Colorectal Cancer Canada, he actively represents the interests of cancer patients and speaks regularly to medical professionals, industry, government, and patient groups, both in Canada and internationally covering various aspects of colorectal cancer prevention, treatment, and survivorship. Barry sits on the board of directors of numerous corporations, not-for-profit organizations, and foundations. This includes Colorectal Cancer Canada, Exactus Innovation, the Canadian Personalized Healthcare Innovation Network, Observer, Le Consortium de Recherche en Oncologie Clinique de Quebec, Donald Berman Foundation, 
and Titka Children's Foundation. Barry is a survivor of metastatic colon cancer. He was diagnosed in 1995 when he was obliged to seek health care outside of Canada to fight his disease. His judgment against RAMQ, obtained in the Superior Court of Quebec in 1999, serves as the leading precedent in Canada for the reimbursement of out-of-country health care for patients. It is a huge pleasure to have you with us, Barry. I would like to hear a couple of words from you, please. Well, thanks so much, Boris, and to our entire panel. Uh, at, first of all, for your kind introduction, and, and actually to Brian for that uh, wonderful prelude to our discussion today. I think you really touched on a lot of a lot of points. I I, I think the, the big take-home message is that we're dealing with an ecosystem here. And from a patient perspective, healthcare uh, systems uh, perspective, physician perspective, or researcher perspective, there is not one thing that this pandemic has touched that hasn't affected something else. And Brian, you referred to uh, the question of prevention. Well, in Canada, as many of you know, we have several population-based screening programs, not the least of which in all provinces, with the exception of Quebec to date, we have uh, colorectal cancer screening programs. What we can see from that, if you just, and that's targeted to the population at large, as you know. But imagine, and this is a fact, that these screening programs have been interrupted. So all of a sudden, we have a tremendous amount of people who don't know whether or not they have any symptoms they, because they're being screened, so there's no signs or symptoms, but we don't know if they have a positive fit test. Let's assume that some of those patients would have had a positive fit test. We all of a sudden have a huge backlog in endos endoscopy. And for those positive uh, cases that require surgery, we have a backlog on the surgical side. And for those cases who require treatment, whether it's to uh, because all the cancer has not been removed or for adjuvant therapy, we have a backlog in some cases in treatment or at least a substitution of treatments where we saw people going from IV to oral therapy or their treatment was from a long course in radiation to a short course in radiation. So almost kind of an experimental situation. And then of course we have backlogs of the palliative situation and those sad cases where patients have had to die alone. And these are just some of the examples, just taking the continuum of prevention throughout the system and how it affects it to better understand how no one part can stand alone. And I just focused on prevention. I could do this from the physician or healthcare system point of view or researcher point of view in terms of clinical trials that have been suspended. And the same thing exists. The important thing is to understand that our system has not been built for resilience. In a sense, kind of like in the transportation industry or inventory or, or uh, and from a commercial point of view, it was just in time inventory. And that's not how you build a healthcare system in light of what is going on in today's world. So what we need today, and I could give it to you from any of those perspectives, but I'll, I'll let my colleagues do it from the pharmaceutical and from the surgeon's point of view as well as the industry point of view. But just to say that we need this massive, bold investment. This is the time to act and to act big, to retransform or transform the healthcare system in Canada in every way possible looking at this continuum. It doesn't help to change one component because as I said, there's a whole continuum that we have to look at. And this is the time to do it. So just briefly open, open the discussion with that and, and, and go on to some of our other great presenters today and I'm looking forward to discussing with everybody further. Thank you very much, Barry. I will now introduce Dr. Calvin Law who is the chief of the Odette Cancer Center and vice president for regional cancer services at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center. Dr. Law trained in general surgery at McMaster University in Hamilton. He completed a surgical oncology fellowship at the University of Toronto and a master's of public health at Harvard University's School of Public Health. He has been faculty staff at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center since 2001 and is now Professor of Surgery at the University of Toronto with cross appointment to the Institute of Health, Policy, Management and Evaluation. 
As an educator, Dr. Law has been recognized with teaching awards at the undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate levels. This includes the Canadian Association of General Surgery Resident Teaching Award, the Bruce Tobey Surgical Teaching Award, and the Robert Mustard Mentorship Award. Dr. Law has also served a term as examiner for the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. Dr. Law's clinical practice is devoted to hepatobiliary, pancreatic, and gastrointestinal malignancies. He also has a subspecialized practice in neuroendocrine tumors, and he is the co-founder of the Susan Leslie Multidisciplinary Neuroendocrine Tumors Clinic. He takes an active part in the treatment of patients with this affliction. Dr. Law, Calvin, welcome. Thank you for having me, and it's wonderful to be on this panel. You know, Barry and I have known each other for years as well, and so it's always nice to see him. Uh, I hope uh, I can reflect on a lot of the excellent comments made by particularly Brian at the beginning and concerns shared by Barry, but I also hope to share with you some glimmers of hope in our system as we discuss some of our topics more. Calvin, thank you. It's great to have you with us. And now, last but not least, I will introduce Sandra Hanna, CEO of Neighborhood Pharmacy Association of Canada. In addition to this role, she is a Chief Innovation Officer at Gold Links Health Solutions, a pharmacist, pharmacy owner and operator, and a consultant in the areas of pharmacy operations and professional practice. Sandra spent over 10 years working in and managing operations at a community pharmacy and became a part owner at an independent pharmacy in 2013. She is passionate about advancing pharmacy practice, improving workflow efficiencies, and exploring novel ways to deliver enhanced value and care to patients in a multidisciplinary collaborative practice environment. Sandra is a widely sought after advisor in the industry, in the evolution of practice and operations, as well as in collaborative practice and change management. She's a graduate of the Faculty of Pharmacy at the University of Toronto, and is currently completing her master's in health law at Osgoode Hall Law School. Sandra, welcome to our discussion. Thank you so much, Boris, and thanks uh, for having me. Uh, thanks. I'm, I'm humbled to be uh, on this panel with such esteemed panelists and uh, speaking with you all today. Um, I guess from my perspective as, as a pharmacist, having been on the front lines and also having uh, worked uh, in the advocacy space with neighborhood pharmacies, our, one thing that perhaps differentiates my view, um, it, whereas others have sort of talked about, you know, the, the system being capped or at capacity and experiencing backlogs, backlogs as a result of the pandemic, in our sector, I think we really saw an unlocking of potential and an unlocking of capacity uh, that, that pharmacies can bring to, to healthcare systems. I think you know, typically pharmacies um, have always been seen as, as part of the healthcare system, but a bit of an adjunct to the healthcare system um, as private entities and private sector uh, players, but haven't really been seen as, as a core part of the healthcare system. But in this past 18 months or so, we've really seen the system, the public, policymakers really rely on pharmacies. And that's that's really become very evident over the past 18 months in so many different areas. Um, we've seen this in terms of the reliance of the system on immunizations. Pharmacies in Canada have now administered about 10 million or just over 10 million vaccines uh, for COVID. Last year, close to 6 million flu vaccines. Um, you know, we've seen that in terms of the reliance on, on the administration or the distribution of COVID tests in many, in many provinces. Uh, we've seen that in terms of the, um, you know, the, the reliance of the public even on, on pharmacists to help them navigate the health system and what, what, you know, where to go and what to make of all the information that's out there. Because the reality is pharmacies are in every community. Canadians, 95% of Canadians live within five kilometers of a community pharmacy. Um, pharmacists are highly trusted and pharmacies are, and pharmacists are typically the first point of contact that most Canadians have with the healthcare system. So there's a huge, you know, potential to, to better utilize pharmacies. And we saw the system and the public and governments turn to our sector, um, you know, throughout the pandemic more than they ever have before. And pharmacies were there and they were able to deliver 
you know, very turnkey and fairly quick solutions because we were ready to provide those solutions to the public. So uh, I think from our perspective, that's, I think the main differentiator is that, you know, these are things that we've been, we've been offering for a long time, but we, we really saw the value of that convenience, accessibility, and trust um, in the past 18 months. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. It's a pleasure to have you with us. And thanks for sharing that perspective from the pharmacy space and uh, from your perspective. I think uh, right now, throughout the introductions and these discussions, uh, we have exposed some of the status quo, uh, some of the changes that are taking place in the ecosystem. Uh, I'm curious whether there's uh, perhaps something uh, in addition, uh, maybe Calvin, that you could add on some of the impact on the sector, what you have learned, what you're, are you seeing as the dynamic and the current trends in uh, patient care and uh, obviously as a significant provider in your space. Uh, thanks, Boris. Uh, I, I'm going to start with a few comments and I hope I can break out and link to some of what Sandra said that was really important. Uh, I think one thing on the, on the glimmer of hope side, I would say, is that our healthcare system, particularly in Ontario, has always had some thread of collaboration and uh, I would say system oversight. And I'm very lucky to be in the cancer system that has had this kind of grown up and developed uh, probably more so than some of my colleagues have had, uh, partly due to the culture and organization of cancer care. And what that means is, you know, cancer leadership throughout the province connects with each other minimum once a month. And even before the pandemic, if any cancer center ran into an issue that could be as simple as a pipe leak affecting a radiation machine, all other 14 cancer centers would always respond quietly, never really in the news, but we would take up the patients, we'd figure out how to go. And this uh, has transformed during the pandemic in the Toronto area to an operational table that actually involves all of the regional partners in this GTA region. And I think uh, almost sometimes with tears, I realize how well we could have collaborated. So in the worst times, um, you know, you would see our colleagues at other hospitals, not just Sunnybrook, other hospitals would look to us and say, you know, we're going to take this load of patients today because we need to keep Sunnybrook open for the traumas that we can't treat here. I mean, to see that level of system thinking and, and not just, it's not my problem today, it's yours, was, was a, a sign of encouragement. Um, in the operating room, which, uh, you know, is my primary clinical practice, you could, we saw that too. Uh, when the operating rooms shut down and at Sunnybrook, similar to a lot of large hospitals, we went from something like running uh, just almost 25 operating rooms a day to three. Uh, so you can imagine the number of operations that are canceled, but to see the group of surgeons collaborate and understand that there are certain key priorities that had to be done. And immediately surgeons went into a triage mode. They would work together, find the most important patients and find a way in those three operating rooms to get it done. But linking back, without getting to all the complexities, back to what Sandra said, is it also made us realize that there were things that people are important, but they, they had to wait. But we also realized that as good as this sort of complex specialty, plus or minus community care could get together and get this kind of level done, the people that waited showed us an opportunity to partner with others. And I think Sandra said it best. There's probably a lot of un... Uh, recognized uh, collaborative potential out there that could help treat some of the other things. It brought to light what we might be very good at doing in the public health care system. And one question we're going to have to ask ourselves after this is for the sustainability of our future care, did we just learn what we're really good at and where we have opportunities to partner out so that we can keep whole what is most the, the you know, I hate, you know, it's, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't get too nauseated to, for me to use the Sunnybrook mantra, but to, to maintain our promise to do what, when it matters most is the Sunnybrook motto. But that, that should mean something. It's not just a motto. What are we supposed to be doing when it matters most? And other things matter a lot too, but they, do they need to happen at a you know, big hospital setting? I don't know. And it's, it's something that we're left to question now. Back to you, Boris. Thank you, Calvin Berry. What are oh, your perspectives? Uh, you know, just as a follow-up to both what uh, Sandra and Calvin had to say, um, definitely we have to look at new models of care. And I think that's essentially what you're talking about. You know, some interesting examples might be how do you, perhaps there's certain things that we don't need to do in a hospital. Colonoscopy is an example. Maybe if we took those or maybe blood work and 
and some other uh, in Quebec uh, um, uh, radiology, for example, could be in what I term survivorship clinics in the cancer system to do the follow-up, to work again with general practitioners in oncology, how to do a proper handoff to the community when someone's completed their treatment, for example, and relieve the stress in the hospital system. So that's just one potential example in, in a new model of care that we could see. But also getting to Santa's points on public-private partnerships, this is a huge opportunity and really an unfulfilled one, whether it be at the manufacturer level. So for example, we do not even have any vaccines being produced in Canada, and that at least probably not even for another year or so. And this is a huge you know, uh, uh, call out to this investment or the lack of investment that has been done in the past. Um, at every level, we can see this opportunity to, pro to, to partner with not-for-profits, such as patient uh, organizations to help provide support systems. And from a, a recent, we've done four round tables, uh, thought leadership round tables with uh, patients, physicians, uh, healthcare systems, people, and researchers, we see that there's a huge opportunity uh, to fill that gap by partnering uh, with patient organizations so that patients could better know how to navigate the system. After all, what happened amongst the confusion when this pandemic hit? People didn't know where to go. They were afraid to go to hospitals. They didn't have PPE, calling out for a huge investment in this in, in making sure that we have the capacity and materials and supplies, both for cancer care and in general. So huge opportunities, certainly with the pharmacies to work together. But let me just make one additional call out the need for data. In order to run these new models of care, we need uh, really quick access to data and it has to be shared data. It could be aggregate data, but it has to be shared and it has to be federated across the country. And then just, I'll just, you know, add one last, you know, point, you know, our system of healthcare systems being divided by provinces because of these jurisdictional issues was a, was was a disaster for us because we had no national policies to deal with this pandemic altogether and uh, you know this is something that that needs to change immediately but that's part of this great what i would call a great change or great investment super investment in the ecosystem so that all these things can be brought together and it comes down at the very end to that one patient who is caught at the middle of a pandemic not knowing where to go or who to see and obviously, the more dire the situation the, uh, that that patient is in, the more difficult it is. But I also, just to call out to the healthcare system, we've seen some diamonds in the rough here as well. And we've spoken to patients who have had absolutely perfect care, or, um, you know, it's, even though there were changed therapies and so forth. But I think we have to uh, wait a little bit to see what is the effect of changing these types of treatments. From, oral, from IV to oral or from short, from long course radiation to short course, from using regular biopsies from the pathologist's point of view, um, who were also overwhelmed because they had to do the COVID tests in addition to the cancer pathologies. Uh, so another, another example of backlogs going down through the system. Um, you know, how can we partner to make sure these things happen? And there's ample opportunities that are being discussed to bring these new models of care to make these public, private, and not-for-profit partnerships. But the question is, who are we convincing? Who is going to make these choices? Is it the federal government in our, in our, uh, in our federated system? Or is it at each provincial uh, you know, body level? Or is it at the local level, as you point out, Calvin, uh, you know, in the GTA area? Uh, so these are, these are huge challenges that we, we cannot lose the, um, the momentum that we have now. Uh, certainly, we're going to be with COVID for another few years, uh, so we can't even say post-COVID yet, but we have to start preparing for that post-COVID so that it's not like happened with SARS-1, right? We had the warnings. We had the information. We knew what we should have been doing, and we did nothing. Nobody listened to those uh, calls uh, for change. Yes, yes, Sandra. I, I was actually going to say that based on what Barry has shared and the discussion that uh, Brian initiated on homeostasis, uh, what Calvin is talking about with triage, Barry talked about potentially outpatient procedures and the growing role of pharmacies that you highlighted after your introduction. I was curious if you have a perspective on this and it sounds like you do. 
I do. I was trying to get in there, but at the, but at the same time, Barry, I think it's like you were reading my mind. Um, I think you know. I think there's a few things that you touched on that that I wanted to raise. One is scope. One is sort of what are we enabling each of our providers and practitioners to do? Um, you know, we we have so many great. Um, resources in the system. And, you know, we often have sort of, um, we have a, a, a fairly um, typical way of looking at problems. We look at investing in hospitals, we look at investing in, you know, nursing and, and you know, we look at sort of the same solutions oftentimes, I, I don't want to say always, but we often look at very similar solutions to a growing problem. And I think there's an opportunity for us to look at the numerous different resources we have in the system so that we can think of creative ways and ensure that each of those providers and practitioners is working to their best potential. And so that we're taking the most value out of each of those providers in the system. So Barry, you mentioned it, do we need to do colonoscopies, for example, in a hospital? Can we take those out of the hospital so we can create more capacity in the hospital for things that can only be done in the hospital? Similarly, from the pharmacy standpoint, pharmacists in Alberta, for example, can initiate therapy for blood pressure for diabetes for so many different things so you know we, we could look at diagnosis by the physician or the general practitioner really have them focusing on disease um, disease screening and identification so that they can really address more people and have you know have more of a role in, in the disease screening and identification and then have pharmacies initiate and manage therapy we study medicines for five six years you know so so this is this is what we're trained to do um, but we're not really taking advantage of, of that training and expertise of the pharmacies in many cases, in some provinces more than others, but in most provinces, I would say we're really underutilizing the clinical expertise of the pharmacists. So, you know, that's one example. So it, it, increasing the scope of practice of, of pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, so that we can really maximize the value that each of those providers can bring to the system and make sure that, you know, we can, we can direct those really serious cases or complicated cases to, you know, those who, who have the most experience and expertise to manage them and really kind of create capacity in all the different sectors of the healthcare system. Um, that's, that's one, I think, really important and huge opportunity. And, and we're working on that, you know, as, as an advocacy association, that's something that we work on um, in all provinces. The other piece that, that Barry mentioned that's so important is the data. So really the, the importance of being able to build systems and information systems that allow us to all access and, and have the opportunity to contribute to the patient's care, not in silos. And that's a bigger bigger nut to crack, certainly, but it's a really critical one. And as we start to think about um, data systems and we start to look at what we did for COVID even just to create, I mean, we've been talking about a central vaccination record for decades and we haven't done it, but in, you know, in less than a year, we did it. So I think where there is a will, there is a way, but I, I you know, I think there's there's some work to be done there, and, and there's some great things that have been accomplished over the past year and a half that I think we need to look at and, um, A, not walk back, um, because I think there is a real risk of us sort of saying, okay, this was a temporary solution, and we, you know, we got great value out of these temporary solutions, now let's go back to the way we were doing things, and I think it's the the pressure and the onus really is on us as, as providers and as healthcare providers and as Canadians to really drive that conversation to say we've, make, we've made some real gains over the past year and a half. We need to continue to build on that momentum rather than say looking at them as temporary solutions um, to, to a, a current pandemic or current situation. Um, so I'll, I'll, leave it, I'll leave it at that and turn it back over to you, Boris. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. And it's, it's helpful to understand Obviously, some of the challenges we're going through, uh, some of the opportunities, and so one of the questions that has come up from the audience is comparing COVID to 9-11 of the healthcare system. And then in the future, the discussion is, will we see the healthcare system very clearly defined and very clearly in the pre-COVID, and it's one way, and then it's completely different after COVID? And if so, how do we avoid some sort of a K-shaped development curve? How do, we, how do we monitor, how do we track and actually insert the good changes, make sure they stick versus succumbing to some of the negatives of the COVID epidemic and its impact on the healthcare system? What, what do you folks think? What, what can be done to track and make sure there's progress as opposed to a development backwards? Uh, Brian. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's a great question. And the reality is, 
it is the leaders across industries and throughout the healthcare system that are going to write the book and determine how this does play out uh, post the pandemic, uh, just as it uh, was post 9-11. You're right, 9-11 is a good example because I think it exposed underlying geopolitical tensions uh, that maybe most uh, of the general public were not paying attention to. And I think COVID-19, to a certain extent, has done the same thing. It's, 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 it's brought to the forefront for everyone who leads a business or um, who consumes healthcare or who is involved in education or any sector uh, was exposed to the impact of care gaps that occurred. And what happens when health is in question? I mean, it, it hugely increased the value that we place as a society on health and our willingness to make tremendous sacrifices in terms of the things that we do, how we do them, our economy, our investments, uh, in order to pursue uh, a resolution for that. To me, the key here really is data. And I know that Barry and Sandra have touched on that. Uh, but because we saw incidence and prevalence and mortality and hospitalization numbers on a daily basis, you type in, you know, CTV news in uh, the Google browser and up pops the, uh, uh, you know, the, the daily numbers, that measurement and transparency around the care and the health of the population raised awareness in the broad system of stakeholders that needed to take place in order to enact the regulation and policy change uh, for uh, a real difference in the approach uh, to COVID-19. Uh, so I think we have to find a way to track the incidence of colorectal cancer, the incidence of suicide, the incidence uh, of um, heart attacks, uh, of other major health events so that there is an awareness and it requires leaders beyond the healthcare system to take note and to take action. Uh, if you're leading a business, you have to pay attention to the health of your staff and your stakeholders. You can't ignore that. It has a, an integral and vital part of uh, your business's success and sustainability. And in the past, we didn't have great ways to measure that. In the future, we need great ways to measure that so we can take action and take steps uh, to achieve the resilience that we need. Brian, th thanks for talking about this continuous feedback loop, right? Inputting data, having action, feedback, and hopefully progressing uh, together as a society in the healthcare system. Uh, Barry, from the perspective of Colorectal Cancer Canada's experience and your wealth of experience in the industry, speaking about Karen Smolligan's questions of before COVID and after COVID, and also developing uh, or adding to Brian's idea of data measurement and measuring things like colorectal cancer. What do you think are the key opportunities to be different after COVID? And what can we do with the tracking of data? Is there enough infrastructure? What needs to be done to facilitate that? So it's a very complex question, I have to say. First, because of the constitutional issues in Canada, the different healthcare systems and the various private, uh, privacy legislation uh, that exists and new ones coming into place in Quebec, for example, uh, similar to what exists in Europe that make it a real challenge to share information. So we have to find new ways and we are finding new ways of touching data in various jurisdictions without removing the data from that jurisdiction. And this is pretty novel at this point in time. But the real question is, who is going to regulate this? Is this the federal responsibility or is it an interprovincial uh, inter responsibility and something that we really have to focus on? There's no excuse any longer for not being able to share data and for not being transparent. I'll call out Quebec for being one of the least transparent in terms of access to data. Particularly, um, you know, I'll, I'll say I recently spoke to the uh, PQC, the Programme uh, Cancerologie de Québec, and, uh, you know, we see some data, but there is a uh, inability to share that data in the public purview. And it's horrendous. Uh, this is the only way decisions can be made. You can do proper health planning, and it has to be on a, uh, not only a provincial basis, but in many cases, 
if we're going to advance research in this country, which is something we haven't quite touched on yet, um, this is there's a huge need for federating this type of data, particularly as we enter into this new world of precision medicines today. So I'll, I'll leave it with that because uh, I, I could probably speak on that the whole day. <laughs> That's helpful. I, I think it's very important for all of us to realize what are the obstacles and to be able to map up far ahead of how those obstacles could be removed or new solutions provided to achieve the goals, especially when it seems like everyone agrees data is key, data is important, and people do want to see a very different world on the other side of COVID. And speaking of that, the, the other side of COVID, one of the things that has been highlighted right now by RR, one of the attendees, is the emergence of telehealth services, the emergence of telemedicine. And both from the RN's perspectives and D perspectives, there's a lot of change in how those practitioners operate within the system as the system is changing. So one of the questions that I was wondering, Calvin, whether you might have a perspective on how do you see filling the employment gap as perhaps some of the aging MDs and RNs aren't as accustomed, aren't as ready to learn telemedicine. How do you see the gap uh, and the impact on the quality of care in general and also the quality of care through telehealth uh, as a result of the digitization? and the restrictions during COVID pandemic. Uh, maybe I'll start a little bit broad and then I'll get into that specific example. So, I mean, first off, Ontario has a, a tremendous amount of virtualized me medicine. And, and one of them to refer back to uh, some of the previous topics was that we have a lot of data. I think we still struggle with uh, how fast we get it, how comprehensive should we collect and who should collect it. But that's What's getting better now is we're learning not to duplicate it again. So the worst thing about data collection is when hospitals already collect it and then you send in another person hired to collect it again. So hopefully we can avoid that and learn how to do that better. Virtual, there's another aspect. I think uh, Terrence Mulligan had, had some questions. It was pretty good. The, the questions are excellent. But I do want to point out that one aspect of virtual has to be virtual networks. So one thing to avoid that K-shaped curve that Terrence was referring to is we've got to work better as a network. So having underserviced areas is no good for anybody. Um, competition among hospitals to be who's the shiniest is, is clearly great for the business of hospitals, especially in the GTA, particularly related to donors. But the thing is this, you could see how badly society has been injured and still is injured by the non-recognition of how all of us are important and play a cog in the wheel of just all of us. Now, we can't allow, um, when we recover, an area to become weak so we can be shinier. Somehow, we have got to take all the lessons we've learned. So you take all these specialists that have to sort of sit in these kind of special places like the UHN or Sunnybrook or, you know, those uh, Unity Health. But how do we take that? We know why they have to sit there. They have, they have an environment that they, they need to be in to keep practicing highly specialized medicine. But virtual medicine has allowed us to provide care elsewhere. Why can't, um, I'll take my group, for example, why can't the liver surgery group at Sunnybrook not be the liver surgery group for Brampton? It can. You, you can virtualize your care out there. You can interact with patients and providers out there. Uh, it doesn't have to be just a one-on-one -on -one, straight up uh, virtual telemedicine appointment with a patient. Virtual medicine means we can virtually lend our services there, lend our ability to help guide a patient's care, and then focus on what we need to do here while a lot of the other care can be provided. And if we do that, we will actually create a lot more resiliency in the, pro in the whole system overall. But going to the last part, which is just straight up virtual care, Boris, you asked a great question. Uh, as, as always, as we talk about the changes that will have to come, you, you know that I have certain members of the team that will always come to my office and says, don't even think about it. This is just temper. We're going back to where we are. Like you're always going to get somebody to say that. And I think one thing we're trying to do is reimagine virtual care. Um, just as a, a little clue to the pilot is we're, we're trying to figure out how to use things like Zoom and a coordinator who might be better at Zoom to just get a physician who may not be good at this to sit at a terminal and we wheel patients in front of them like a clinic and show them a few tools uh, to help them learn uh, how to use it better. We'll get there. Um, uh, my dream one day would be that in the context of a conversation with a patient, you know, uh, a, a good computer algorithm can already pick up what needs to be ordered and get rid of a lot of the paperwork that has to be done after you interact with a patient. It kind of 
Can you imagine an AI program that can listen to you and then sort of get, spit out, okay, I think you wanted a CT scan in three months and right. blood work in two weeks or something, and it's like that ready. So those are the kind of things that we, we have to work on um, in order to get all of us uh, out to the front. And um, I hope that helps answer some of those questions. I think it does in a big way, Calvin, and you're talking about collaborations within the organizations, outside of the organizations, collaborations between folks who understand technology and who still need to learn. And we're also talking about collaborations across different sector participants, which you've talked about, uh, Barry, uh, Brian, Sandra, all of you. I'm curious, uh, uh, Barry, do you have additional perspectives on collaborations across sectors? So and how that impacts the overall, the overall outcomes and also perhaps the telemedicine question. I'll just to come back to some of the virtual visits. And, you know, there's <clears throat> virtual visits, I think, are uh, sort of not a new thing, but one of the things that uh, I think can be enhanced throughout the country. There's no, there's no question about it that it's had some successes, but it's also had its faults, too. For example, in melanoma, where some cases, uh, you know, have been misdiagnosed or not seen. Uh, so there are many things that you really have to consider, you know, wh when it's appropriate. So I don't think it's a total replacement. That's the first thing. I think that there is a big need to have face-to-face -face visits. And certainly we've heard that from physicians as much as, um, as from patients as well, although sometimes it is convenient. But it's also, um, you know, there's certain things you just can't read from a patient. Uh, uh, I think, you know, just you know, virtually or just by spending a little bit more time, you start to see the hesitation or, or whatever that question, uh, you know, is. But certainly, um, especially in remote areas, this is a big advantage. Um, but as I said, it's not the, uh, the be all and end all for every, uh, for every case. Uh, um, and I would say that, you know, the, the alongside with that is what we were talking before with Sandra was mentioning as well as, as actually everybody else is the access to data. Patients need to have access to um, their scans, to their, to their reports, and it has to be done in a unified way so that whether you go to the pharmacist, as Sandra was mentioning before, or whether it's you know, with your general practitioner when you're seeing them, and hopefully we'll have a greater use of those uh, general practitioners in oncology, um, you know, that, that they can share the same uh, information. And you know, I'll just close by saying, we need a huge investment in capacity. We already hear, about this lack of capacity for whatever reason that patient that in our healthcare system that that patients are underserved and, and the hospitals are you know have to double up their hours so to speak in order to to, to fill these gaps uh, just to to um, to take on the um, the losses in, in a sense that we've had during COVID. And one example of that is there was a Health Canada report saying that we have to increase colonoscopy by four percent four percent across the board just to, over the next two years, just to pick up uh, all those lost colonoscopies uh, that didn't happen in the last two years. So this just gives you an idea of the massive investment and capacity that we have to do in staff. And, uh, you know, something that came out, uh, so I, I know that Calvin won't bring this out, so I'm, I'm definitely going to bring this out. So it came up in, in our uh, thought leadership round table with physicians, and that is the burden on healthcare physicians and the need to have a chief wellness officer in hospitals in order to address the needs of the health professionals who are really be bearing this load. So uh, just a little call out to that, maybe get you guys started on that. I, I was 100% that Calvin wouldn't bring that one up. <laughs> if, if I can comment. Yeah, Barry, because the mental health toll has been huge in the public and it has been extreme on the health practitioners and people who've been holding the line in making sure that we go through this crisis and uh, end up on the other side in as best shape as possible, like Calvin and others supporting supporting the patients. Uh, Sandra, uh, you wanted to add to Barry's comments? Yeah, I, I kind of wanted to pick up on, on Brian, Calvin and Barry's comments and just sort of note, um, you know, Brian talked about, you know, our responsibility as leaders and, and you know, leaders of, of organizations across the country to lead this change and drive this change. I think, Beyond that, it's, you know, as leaders of organizations, we drive change in response to the needs of customers, right? So, you know, in 
in a healthcare system, we've seen what Canadians are, are looking for. We've seen what they're demanding. We've seen, you know, how things have become more accessible to them over the past 18 months. Virtual care being one of those examples, collaboration being one of those examples, you know, transparency being one of those examples. And I don't think we have the luxury of going back. I don't think we have the luxury of saying, you know, somebody's not willing to adopt to these new models of care. I think we, you know, we we have seen where Canadians are demanding. We, we've seen that, you know, Canadians are, are accessing care in a different way and they're not going to go backwards. It can't possibly be easier to order something off Amazon than to access healthcare services. That's just not acceptable. Um, and so um, I, I think it, it is on all of us. And, and I don't just mean healthcare providers, I don't just mean health system partners, I think it, it is on all Canadians to demand that, you know, that drive forward from our policymakers, both at a federal and uh, a provincial level, because, you know, we all are recipients of this healthcare system and we, we need to drive that change forward. And, and to drive that change forward, the public needs to demand it. And then it is on us as providers to say, these are the barriers you need to break down. These are the enablers you need to put in place to ensure that we can deliver on the overall picture of what Canadians are demanding. And I, I think that that we've done such a great job at that over the past 18 months, but kind of going back to my earlier point, we, we can't let that be a temporary thing, that collaboration, that innovation, that, you know, um, that um, acceleration of, you know, of policy and of, you know, data integration, that that can't be a one time occurrence. And we, we need to build on those things. So I, I do think that we all as Canadians need to push for that change and push for that um, continued uh, forward sort of path. Um, and we are the ones that can help government identify the how. Um, as, as leaders in, in our respective sectors. Um, and the only last thing I'll comment on is just as an example, you know, one of those barriers is funding. So for primary care physicians, for pharmacists, we, we didn't have any funding to provide that care virtually before COVID happened. And because there was limited and restricted access to healthcare providers, governments put in place virtual fees and, and you know, billing codes for providers to be able to deliver that care. That's, that's not something that's seen on the surface, but little things like that that are critical to allowing us to actually do these services and bring these services to Canadians, they didn't exist before. And we actually don't know the future of those billing codes. We don't know if that is temporary. It hasn't been communicated to most providers that this is going to remain in place. So we don't know the future of these things. So it is on us as Canadians to demand that level of care so that we can ensure that we can maintain those service levels. And that's and that's great. So it's really the whole ecosystem of providers, patients, biotech, pharmacies, but it's the society at large that needs to form and foster the change. Brian, did you have a perspective? Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. And there's some very interesting questions in the chat and comments from Terrence Mulligan and Louise Binder. And I'm seeing those come in. I mean, we have to be better consumers of healthcare. Uh, and we have to be much more educated about the entire ecosystem and how the system works. And the reality is most people really don't know. And you have to be aware of anybody that comes and says, there's a simple solution here. Um, it's, not, it's not just we need more doctors. It's not just we need more hospitals, which I think is probably the immediate uh, solution that comes to mind. Um, it is more innovation. We know that it is more prevention. Uh, it is more, uh, you know, primary care. Uh, it is more measurement and data. But we do need people to be much more educated about how the system functions and how it works together, and much more patient and encouraging of our um, policymakers who are trying their best to implement new solutions and learn uh, because we're not going to get there uh, by uh, any one single magic bullet or solution. Oops. Boris, you're on mute. I, I, yeah, I thought it was my speaker. <laughs> ah, oh yes. So uh, the, thank you, thank you, Brian. So there's a, a whole comprehensive holistic approach 
it seems like we have to all really come together as, like we said, all of the perspectives that are here on this call, there's the public, there's the government, how could this dialogue be facilitated? I know that many of you involved are in organizations, nonprofits, uh, advocacy outside of your primary responsibilities. Can you talk a little bit about that to close off uh, our discussion today, perhaps, how you can see this discussion as a society moving forward to actually impact change? Because it is very complicated and there's a lot at stake, but there's also lots to be done. So what, what can be done? So I would say that we need a national strategy and we have to call for that as soon as the government, the federal government is formed, but it really has to happen in partnership with the provinces at the same time. So the uh, interprovincial, uh, you know, ministers of health have to really work at this together with the federal government for a massive restructuring of the healthcare system and, and talk about investment in all of the things that we talked about today in a in a long term strategy session and one by the way that should not change because of a change of government so we need to have it you know extend over over a longer period of time and not be subject to those those types of changes uh, I, I just want a, a little shout out to all the not-for-profits the smaller ones as well as the bigger ones in this country who really were unrecognized by the uh, any support from the federal government or even the provincial governments throughout this thing and really were on the front line of helping patients navigate the system. And they, uh, they seem to have been forgotten along the way. So uh, uh, although we always talk about the not-for-profits uh, working together in partnership, uh, in this case, um, we were kind of left to hold our own. But, uh, but we're there and we're still here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Barry. I think, uh, I think this is very helpful for me uh, certainly, and I'm certain it's helpful for our audience to understand where the thought leadership is in biotech and patient advocacy in provider and pharmacy worlds right now, so that we can hopefully change uh, the healthcare systems globally uh, and in Canada for the better, and that this turning point of COVID is actually one that we can channel productively into better health and better living in our society uh, going forward. Everybody, uh, Barry, uh, Brian, Calvin, Sandra, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's been an insightful and interesting discussion. Uh, thank you for your time and uh, sharing your perspectives with, with our audience. Thanks for having us, Boris. Take care, everyone. Thank you.